Here we go. Here we go. Hey, yo, what it is and what's good, y'all? Welcome back to 280 Plus, the social media podcast where I take the conversations off the timeline, go beyond the tweets. We try to dig deep. I'm your host, Lowe's Def, and uh, we back here with another solo episode. And uh, don't worry, y'all. You know, we're going to get around to having some guests. Um, again, man, it's just turnarounds be quick I man i actually i actually wanted to have a guest on and then just the weekend man got busy and and again we, we're recording a little bit late but it is what it is man we're gonna we're gonna get the content out for you i still i love i love doing this so we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna do what we gotta do man and uh just just um you know share some things we got a lot of headlines today we got some headlines we got some things that kind of went on over the weekend um and a couple other little things um no relationship stuff this week so no no spicy stuff but if you want to hear about me talking about relationships actually it's a plug shameless plug um i am also you know i'm a co-host of another podcast called recap and record with my man levi mccurdy i'm host of the what are we doing podcast and uh we are covering uh love is blind love is blind season five right so we're on episode two um of that and if you know about love is blind the way they drop these episodes they drop them in like chunks right so so episode one we're covering four episodes we're covering episodes one through four um episode two we covered episodes five and five through seven and then um i think we, we i think we got two more drops all right we got we got a drop coming this week we get two episodes and then we got to drop the following week that's going to include the finale so it's a quick season but we're going to try to like make sure that we're rolling right into another show because because this season to recap and record we just want to have a little bit of variety we might kind of stay in that dating uh reality show wave um but we we're, we're trying to be a little bit more consistent um and uh, again stuff that we can kind of talk about um on a weekly basis though so yeah episode two is out right now so if you want to check out um my other our other youtube channel um the recap and record podcast channel and you can check out um episodes one and two we drop it we drop our clips um you can find the clips on my on my instagram page you can find them on uh, what are we doing podcast instagram page but also we have a recap and record um, page and that's where i typically drop anything that i do like with the shy when i do my recaps and stuff like that any type of any type of tv show that i'm watching um uh any anything where i'm recapping something you know I, we put it on that platform i put it on that platform i kind of i, I kind of run the instagram page you know what i mean I've, I've been telling levi that he could he could throw some shit on there too whatever but you know it is what it is but yeah we we're in we're in the midst of season two and so yeah, I'm working. You know, we working double time and stuff like that. But it's it's a it's an amazing experience, man. I love working with Levi, making content, man. I wish, I wish somehow we could do this full time. Like I wish we could do it full time, um, because he he's he's a he's a great producer of content, um, on the tech on the technical side. And then he does he has that he has a good personality. You know what I mean? And I feel like we're like a good yin and yang. And uh, I've been I've, I've known this guy for years, man. So we kind of just feed off each other uh, when it comes to the content creation, though. So I feel like, yeah, I get I get I get brilliant idiots vibes, right? Like I'm I would be Charlemagne and he'd be Andrew Schultz or whatever. So um, that's like our dynamic a little bit. So, but um, this week though, um, <laughs> my bad, yo. Um, this week though, we like I said, we got some, we got some um headlines and um you know this past weekend i was excited i was so excited i was so excited this past weekend because i was going to get to see another big headline boxing match right so over the years you know what i mean like you know sometimes i would see a fight sometimes i wouldn't you know what i mean um and and uh you know over the like i've been i'm a boxing fan i've been a boxing fan my whole life um i i've watched it a lot more in the last couple of years because i've i've had a little bit more access to to these fights and things like that we've been you know spending that bread but we also have alternatives so like um again shout out to illegal streaming you know what i mean like a shout out to shout out to the streaming sites that that kind of put that stuff out there again i'm never going to drop or expose these sites because i don't want them to get ever I don't ever want them to get shut down. So, um, but yeah, shout out to, to shout out to illegal streaming. And um, I, I have not missed a major fight this year. Like, and, and there's been four, there's been about four 
big headlined um boxing matches this year. So I seen I seen Tank versus Ryan Garcia, right? Um, and that was entertaining. Yeah, you know I mean, seeing Tank late lay this dude out two times and and knock him out with a body blow, what in in like the middle rounds, it was like round seven, maybe round eight or something like that. Great. Um, then we get the controversial decision um that went the distance, Haney versus Lomacheco. That actually was probably the best fight in terms of back and forth, even though, you know, there were probably some moments where it seemed a little bit boring and it was controversial because when Lomacheco was winning rounds, it looked a little bit more impressive, but Haney did win those early rounds, right? So that's, so he kind of secured, he secured the bag a little bit and then he won the later rounds because Lomacheco, I don't know what, what happened. He wasn't. He wasn't coming with that same intensity, right? So, but again, that was probably like the closest fight, right? Because you know we get a knockout, we get we get a decision, and then, um, then it was the Crawford fight. And I, again, I went, I, I, I was going for like Crawford. I was not going for Spence. I just, I just, I wanted a good fight where I wanted Spence to perform, so it would be a good fight. But I definitely felt that, like looking at just looking at Crawford's tail of the tape and just looking like seeing past fights and highlights, whatever. I'm like, this guy is incredible, man. So, so, and we, we get the knockout there and that, that knockout was, was whew, masterful, man. Cause he, he was, he was punching up on this dude the whole time. And then we get Charlo versus Canelo Alvarez. Right. And, um, you know, I, this one, I definitely went with the underdog, which was Jermel Charlo. And, the reason why I went with Jamel Charlo was because I wanted it to be a good fight. And because if he won, then that creates a better narrative for if him and him and Terrence Crawford were are potentially going to fight. Right. Um, there was some speculation talking about how, um, you know, Crawford might fight Canelo and, and, but Crawford is like, nah, I'm not going to fight Canelo. And, Canelo is like a little bit heavy, is a lot heavier. And this and, and this guy, Charlo, had to had to go up and wait to go fight Canelo Alvarez or whatever. So um he definitely was the underdog. And he, you know what I mean? But he, you know, Charlo is impressive, like in his own right. Like he he's been impressive in his career. Um, and he's he's a pretty good fighter, or whatever. But this was it was a bum ass Charlo, man. Bum ass fight. Um, definitely the, of, of all the four that I just named, I mean, this included those four fights, the weakest fight of them all, the weakest fight of them all. Um, but yeah, I went for Charlo cause I, I wanted to see a good fight because Canelo was the heavy favorite. Um, you know, everybody knows Canelo for his punching power. Um, Canelo, you know what I mean? Has, he has two losses on his, on his, on his jacket. You know what I'm saying? He lost to Floyd when he was a young boy. You know what I mean? That was, that was a long, I felt like that was a, a ancient. That was a long time ago. Uh, Canelo's 33. So he might've been like 24 years old or something like that. He was young like that when he fought um, Mayweather. And then um, he had another uh, loss. Did, uh, did he lose the Triple G? It might, it might've been the Triple G, but like he has a loss, but then he avenged that loss. Right. So then, you know, I mean, Canelo's coming in as, as the favorite, and that fight was just it was completely one sided. Um, this this fight with Charlo, um, I thought, I thought that Charlo was, I, I, you could tell that yo Canelo hits hard as fuck, yo, like like every everything that he's throwing, it, even the body shots, like it sounds, it just sounded like violent, like it sounded, it sounded real violent, it sounded like. Everything he was was dropping was a bomb. You know what I mean, and he's he's lighting Charlo's body up. Um, you know I mean, he got he caught him a little bit. You know, a couple couple you know power punches in in his head. Like he he got him throughout throughout these rounds, whatever. And Charlo though, you know, there was glimpses where he would he would throw some stuff, but like it just looked like he had no power against against Canelo. Like it looked like. It looked like the stuff that he was throwing, he was landing. I mean, because he he would he would kind of throw some combinations, and it would look kind of it would look all right. Like okay, you know what I mean. And and I kind of commended him for you know what I mean keeping it moving. Like he was he was moving around. He was he was trying to it look it looked like he kind of had a strategy maybe. Like I, and I was like the whole fight. I'm like hoping. I'm like all right all right. Like let's turn up. Let's turn up. Let's turn up. And Charlo never turned up right. And then after the fight, you realize like yeah. And this is the narrative. It was like, yeah, he was running the whole fight. And I'm like running, running away from Canelo the whole fight. And when you look at it in hindsight, um, because like I said, if if you were going for Canelo, it was clear. It was like, damn, he's running away. 
if you're going for Charlo, you're you're like thinking like, ah, uh, you know, I mean, he's he's kind of protecting himself because we've seen guys, um, we've seen guys like Spence, right? Like Spence was getting lit up by by Crawford, right? And and shout out to him for like standing toe to toe, whatever. But then it was just like, yo, move out the way, like like yeah, I mean, when when Spence was fighting. Um, was was fighting Crawford. It was like, yo, Spence, move out the way, like move your head and stuff like that. So like, I so when I looked at Charlo, I was like, all right, at least he's doing that. Like he's 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 not just taking punishment, but he wasn't attacking either. Like you know what I mean. And so a lot of people are looking at him as basically stealing the payday. You know what I mean? Like he only he only did that fight for a big payday. Um, this is probably his biggest fight of his career like at 33 years old this is his even though he has a couple belts whatever this is his biggest fight you know what i mean this is his biggest like headline fight and yeah he, he when you look at it it's like yeah he 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 didn't st- he didn't want to stand toe to toe he didn't he didn't do enough he definitely had no offense for this guy he he might have won he won one round where he was kind of like you know getting getting some punches in whatever and moving around and avoiding some 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 punishment but yeah, it was it was so one sided. Um, everybody wanted to see Canelo knock him out. Like at that point, like it was just like, yo, knock him out, knock him out. And uh, there was a point in the fight where um, Charlo they they said, oh, he made a business decision. Like, he took a knee. Like, and some people like now looking back at it, it's like, yo, that was even pussy too a little bit. Like, like he took a knee because because he was gonna get rocked, man. Like Canelo was probably gonna lay him down, and he took the knee. Um, to kind of avoid some punishment and then but like you would think all right if you take a knee then and or even in the 12th round like I like I just don't understand like these last the last three rounds 10 11 12 you're losing on 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 the cards like there's no way you're gonna win this fight if if you play it safe whatever and it's like why not go out on your shield you know what I mean so to speak that's what you know Dante Wilder would say like why not go out on your shield and why not um why not try to like really, really inflict some punishment or try try to throw throw them hands, man? Like he was you was keeping them, you was keeping them to yourself, man. Throw them hands and see what happens. Yeah, you know I mean, you you could move around and, and throw them hands, but it's like he didn't want to get hit with nothing too crazy. And that's what it was. Yeah, you know I mean, so like, um, and then this was the part that was it was it was really bad on Charlo's end, right? So Charlo. First, he was acting delusional, like he didn't understand why he lost the fight, right? Which, yeah, I mean, you supposed to have confidence in yourself, but like you clearly, you clearly didn't do anything in that fight that mattered. You know what I'm saying? And then you have the nerve, right? Charlo, you have the nerve to come out your mouth and talk about how you want to fight Terrence Crawford. And my man Stu, Biscayne James, man, he um he pointed it out. He was like, he was like, yeah, like this guy perked right up. He perked right up and like had all this energy and talk and talking trash about Crawford and like, yeah, yeah, I, I want Crawford. He called he called him out in the middle of the ring. And it's like Crawford gains nothing. Like, you don't even realize, like, like it don't matter how much shit you talk. It don't matter how much shit you talk. It does nothing for Crawford to fight you now, bro. And that's what I'm saying. I wanted Charlo to win because that would have been another little super fight. You know what I'm saying? That would have been like, oh, shit. Yo, the dude that beat Canelo Alvarez, this guy that moved up two weight classes to beat Canelo, he's about to fight He about to fight Crawford, who, who ain't lost to nobody. You know what I mean? They probably, you know what I mean? Crawford would have to probably move up and wait a little bit. Like, yo, like, this is crazy. And, and Char- Charlo was just basically... Like making excuses and like, oh well, yeah, like I'm, but well, I, I still dominate my division. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm the most dominant person at 154. But it's like, all right, but you wasn't fighting at 154 tonight, and we know that you went up in weight, but you don't get no participation trophies. You don't get no, you don't get no pat on the back, whatever, because you good in your division. Like you, you chose to fight. You didn't have to fight Canelo. Now it's wild because the brother was supposed, Jam- Jamal Charlo was supposed to fight um Canelo and somehow I don't I don't know what happened I think I think there was an injury to the other Charlo and then so then this one uh steps in and this is the one that had the belts and he he basically wasted our time man he wasted our he wasted my Saturday night um like I said uh hype to see him win but he he ain't do his job man he ain't do his job so that was the weekend um Crawford man he ain't worried about this guy and Crawford don't even like this guy but and it, it don't matter. I don't even think as much as Crawford don't like him. 
I don't think he's going to give him a shot. And I don't think he should. I don't think he should give give Charlo no shot. You know what I mean? And it, and it won't even look no type of way. It won't look like he's he ain't ducking him. It's like, bro, this is, come on, man. You're not worthy. You're not worthy, man. You, 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 I mean, you, you tucked your tail in, you know what I mean? And, and you took a knee, you know what I'm saying? Get knocked out, bro. Like, show show us some heart or something like that. Like, because if you would have got, if it would have been just a one side, because it went to a decision. And it's like, obviously, it's a unanimous decision. But it's like, fucking fight, bro. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like go out there and fight. Like, I don't know. So, but I guess it looks better on him. Like, oh, I lost in the decision. I ain't getting knocked out. I ain't getting knocked out. Whatever, man. Like you, you, you knew what you was doing, and and you did not impress, and and everybody is kind of disappointed after that. So, all right. So moving on, moving on, moving on. Um, all right. So, I've been seeing these headlines, and they have finally, they have finally arrested someone in the connection of Tupac Shakur's murder. So, um. <clears throat> Man, and man, they go, they call him Keefy D. Keefy D. Um, he, I mean, his his last name is Keith something, whatever. But um, his last his last name is actually Keith, but they they say Keefy D, whatever. So Keefy D has been arrested um on on um in, in connection to Tupac's murder, and um the reason why this is headlines obviously because everybody been wanting to know who killed Tupac, whatever. Um, but it's also getting headlines because of DJ Vlad. So DJ Vlad, right, has has a long history of putting out incriminating interviews with rappers, with with uh, gang members, um, with different celebrities and things like that. Like he has a he has a history of conducting these interviews where he doesn't show his face. Right. And he asks the most egregious questions. And then, I mean, there a lot of the questions are very incriminating and um. The thing is, people call him a culture vulture, which I, you know, I mean, to many, to many, you know, respects, he is a culture vulture. Um, however, however, um, onus always has to go back to to the people that are doing the interviews because it's like you don't have to tell him half of the things that you're telling him, right? So, so although he does ask incriminating questions, the people that are on his show give incriminating answers, whatever, right? So. So he has a long history of doing that. And Keefe D did an interview with Vlad like four years ago. And he basically admitted like, you know, I mean, he he basically admitted that he he was involved in in the shooting. Right. Um, He, he made a comment about, um, you know, what I mean, all you because it was something about Mike Tyson where like, you know, Mike Tyson was like saying something about him. He was like, man. Psh- you know what I mean? Back like all you know, all we need is all I need to do is one shot or something like that. Like he he made a he made an insinuation about and and Pac was a part of that conversation. And he's like, Yeah, man, you know what I mean, you know what I do, you know what I mean? You just you know, and, and he he implied that, you know what I mean, he he'll he's willing to shoot somebody, whatever. So so the, a lot of what he said in that interview though, and, and, and with Vlad, it was very incriminating, and he does admit like some involvement in the shooting. Um and what's crazy is that is that um he's on record confessing to being in the car, right? So remember, you know, everybody knows it was it was in '96, right? It was after a, it was after a fight, um, and it was on the Vegas Strip, so to speak, or you know, and and uh, they're in the Mercedes or they're in the black car, and then the white Cadillac pulls up on the side. Well, KVD was he was a part of the altercation that happened at the fight, right? So um, if y'all remember, and we're just going to take y'all back a little bit. So Tupac and his entourage, they get into a fight with, with um, uh, members of, of, of Crips. I mean, they were, they were Crips that, that were involved in, in this fight. All right. And, and KVD was a part of that. Like he was, he was there, he was there. And then he, apparently he orchestrated or put together the hit and, and they, they pull up to them in the white Cadillac and KVD is on record saying that he passed the gun to his nephew, which is Orlando Anderson, I believe his name is. And, and Orlando was the one that uh, fired the shots, whatever. So, so, and for whatever reason, you know what I mean? I think it's because of different jurisdictions. Like, I think, you know, um, in Nevada, like they were, they were investigating it, but then, 
the the case that got turned over to L.A. County because L.A. County, they were trying to turn it into like a federal case and they just didn't have they didn't have what they whatever they needed. Um, but in Nevada, you can get charged with murder even if you don't pull the trigger. Right. Like if you're even if you're just an accessory or, or if you orchestrated somehow. So like the laws are different. And and finally, I guess I guess partly DJ Vlad's interview and then some of these other interviews that he's done. Um, it's finally come back to bite him. And um, I guess, I guess what we're, what we're seeing is like Vlad is like right now, he's kind of looked at as like a hero. So it's like, finally, he, these, these incriminated interviews have paid dividends in a positive way, I guess. Right. In a positive way, because, because everybody has wanted to know, like, you know, about Tupac and who killed him, whatever. Um, but apparently, the other three suspects, right, that are, you know, probably in the car, like um, I was I was seeing something even on CNN, like like these other suspects are deceased, whatever. So like this is the last living person that had any kind of connection to it. And, you know, like I said, he's he's incriminated himself multiple times in interviews. And now, um, like I said, he's he's been arrested. And I don't know, like it's I guess, you know, if you are a part of Tupac's family, I, I guess you're happy about it. Right. But. I don't know. It's just weird. Like in, in terms of like, is this justice has, has justice been served, so to speak? And I don't know. I don't like, it's hard to answer that question because it's, 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 that was 27 years ago. You know what I'm saying? That was 27 years ago. You know, probably last month it would have been like 27 years ago. And, you know, the, the police even had information and like, I guess the case went cold. They didn't have the, they must have something they must have other than just these, these conversations they must have something, a smoking gun, so to speak, um, for them to feel like they can do it now. But it's like, yo, y'all y'all knew for a while. Y'all knew for a while. Y'all knew the connections. Everybody knew the connections. Everybody, you know. And for something to happen now, it's like, it's kind of bittersweet because it's like, like, I don't I don't think this is justice necessarily. Sure. Like, you know what I mean? If, if he's being convicted and, you know, he, he was a part of, you know, killing an icon, um, you know, I guess that's good, right? But at the same time, it's like, it's like, where, where was the justice when we needed justice? When the family needed justice, where was that? And it just, it, like I said, it's it kind of leaves like a sour taste, um, in your mouth a little bit because it's like, oh, okay, yeah, all right, about time, um, but it's like too little, too late to me. If if you're asking me, it's like, I, I mean. I don't know. People aren't going to get no restitution. Like, I don't think, you know, the people that were closest to Pac, like in his family, so to speak, like they're, you know, I mean, they're not necessarily present either. I mean, so it's like, I don't know. And we've had how many how many documentaries have we had about Tupac? How many movie reenactments have we had about Tupac? Like, so it's like all this media has been out for all these years. And now finally something's come out. Now, the only thing that's come from this and I've been seeing a lot of little YouTube headlines and things like that. And I don't know if people are just trying to be provocative because I haven't really d dug into that stuff. But they're like, oh, Diddy is next. Like, you know what I mean? Like, oh, or or Diddy is scared about this this uh, Keefe D, uh, you know, uh, arrest because now it's going to tie him back to being a part of Killing Biggie. And I, I don't. I don't want to be a part of it. Like, I don't, I don't want to believe that. Like, unless, and unless people have like hard evidence to say the otherwise, um, I don't, I don't feel comfortable like putting that kind of, kind of smut on his name. Like couldn't putting that kind of dirt on, on Diddy's name to say like, oh yeah, he in fact was, you know, the reason why, or he orchestrated um, Biggie's death. Like it just, it just doesn't make any sense because that was like literally like his, his cash cow and and obviously Diddy was able to still sustain and, and do business, but like I don't I don't think he had any malice towards Biggie, but I don't know, man. That the conspiracy theorists are gonna talk and like that's the next thing. Like people are saying, Well, Diddy's next, Diddy's next. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I don't that's that's a little wild to say, but um we'll see, man. We'll see what happens um in the near future and if if anything else comes from um any other cases are solved based off of this investigation and things like that. So, um, but yeah, that's it, man. That's it for that. Um, let's move on though to the next topic. Let's move on. All right. Let's see where we at, where we at with it. All right. Let's, um, 
since we just we just talked a little bit about sports, uh, we're gonna stay with sports for a second here, and uh, we're gonna give you our weekly uh coach prime update right colorado Bu- buffaloes um update right so um yo man you know they almost got that upset man last week like they almost got that upset um shout out to joy taylor man um from fs1 and uh she was pretty she was pretty vocal and she was like yo if travis hunter plays in that game it might be a different outcome all right it might be a different outcome so um if you didn't know um you know, we, I, we knew that Colorado was stepping into a buzzsaw, right? Like these last couple of weeks, um, you know, I mean, two couple of weeks ago, they lost to Oregon, who was, you know, a top 10 opponent. And then we knew they were going to face another top 10 opponent um, in USC. And, um, you know, that first that first, you know, top 10 opponent, Oregon, they blew them out. They got that blowout, whatever. But. You got to say, man, like, and this is shout out to the players. This is shout out to the players first, but then shout out to Coach Prime because whatever he did, he did, he made sure he prepared these guys for this game, right? He prepared his his guys for the game and they kind of rallied back, right? In the second half, it was a, it was a second half type of rally. And um, they ended up losing 48 to 41. So they lost by a touchdown. Um, and yeah, had, had USC on the ropes, had USC on the ropes, um, shout out to Caleb Williams, their quarterback. Um, he's, you know, uh, Heisman, like front runner, uh, front runner also to be the number one pick. So, and, and that's, that's part of the reason why Shador Sanders might not go to the draft this year because, um, Deion, Deion's like, yeah, my, my son, he don't want to come second to nobody, whatever. So like, he wants to be the guy that, that everybody's looking to, to draft, right. As the number one pick, um, as quarterback. Right. So this is what I got to say though, man, about prime, man. Like they've had, they've had some ups and, you know, I mean, obviously now they're, they're on some downs, right. So now they're three and two, but you know, in the very first game of the season, they, you know, we, we saw that, all right, man, they know how to win a close game, right. Cause they, they won, a high scoring close game to TCU, you know, one by three. They know how to blow a team out, right? Like a team that is not on their level. They know how to blow a team out. So that's what they did to Nebraska, right? Uh 36 to 14. And then and then we've seen that they know how to win in overtime, right? And that's what they did to Colorado State. And then um, so they've been learning, they've been learning, right? You know, Oregon was their first big test. Oregon was their first big test, and they got dismantled, they got destroyed. But they learned from that. They learned from losing to Oregon and they came into that USC game, right? They came into that game and they played a lot better. They played with a lot more heart. They played, they did, they did a lot of the things that they were supposed to do. And, you know, Colorado has some, had some high profile names that were not playing in this game. Right. So I think, I think, right. So now the rankings have changed over the course of the year. Right. So Colorado has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven more games on the regular season. They have seven more games in the regular season and they face, now they only have three more ranked opponents. Now UCLA was ranked and I guess they fell out of rankings. I think Stanford was ranked and they also fell out of rankings. But um, I think, I think th- these two losses are going to be, are, are just going to be things that they learn from. And coach prime is doing what he has to do to teach these guys how to win, how to overcome adversity, right? So I think when they face another ranked opponent um, in like three or four weeks when they play Oregon, uh, Oregon State, and and that's barring that Oregon State still ranked, I think I think they're going to fare a lot better than they did against these other two opponents, right? Then they got Washington State um, a couple weeks after that, um, and I think they're, they're going to fare better against them. Now, you know, football is not – you can't always do like, oh, well, this team beat this team, so then then we can beat that team, right? Like, it doesn't always work like that. It's any given Saturday, any given Sunday, high school, any given Friday night, right? So, like, you, you do have to play the game, but I know – like, I believe in Coach Prime. I believe in him, and – I, I think he's gonna do what he has to do to get these guys ready. Like and they're learning, man. They're learning on the on the job. And it's the I feel like still, even though even though they're on a down point, I think the sky is still the limit, man, for these guys. And I think they can still they can still make some noise, right? Even as a two loss team, they can they can still, you know, they can still make some noise to where they're they're in a, a substantial position and and they can end out with a good season. They still can, you know, and obviously they still have chances to to end with a winning record. So 
Um, so yeah, man, I'm 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 excited for them. Um, and I'm excited to see what they do against those last three ranked opponents. And I I, I truthfully think they're gonna do fine, man. I think they're gonna do fine. I think we're, we're gonna get some upsets. I think they will be ranked again by the end of the season. They will be back in the top twenty five. To say where I I can't I can't say that. But if they beat three ranked opponents, these these next three three these next three ranked opponents, they're certainly gonna be cracking the 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 top twenty five again this season, right? So, um. I did see an interesting video about Prime, and we'll kind of we'll break that down another day. But like he, it was just an interview that he did where, um, he just talked about how like Prime Time has has always been a persona, right? Like it's it's and and I I know a lot of people don't a lot of people don't like like how flamboyant or how how in your face he is, how much trash he talks, whatever. But you know that's something that he he turned on at a certain point in his life when he was you know down in Florida State. And it's it's helped him to propel to where he's at, whatever. And and um, you know, what I mean, like it, it's just this ultimate belief in himself, you know what I mean? And like he talked about having like certain lines rehearsed and things like that. So, but like, you know, probably when I have a guest, we'll probably we'll probably dig into that a little bit more. But um, again, man, I'm proud of everything that he's doing. Um, I still believe and it's still it's still Coach Prime, man. I'm still a part of the Buffalo, uh, Colorado, uh, Colorado Buffalo um, bandwagon there. So, uh, but yeah, moving on, moving on, moving on. So getting away from sports. Um, this is an update. Um, this next thing that we're going to talk about is an update from um, something that we covered earlier this year. So. Um, y'all remember a couple months ago I talked about the fearless fun. All right, the fearless fun. So, um, if you remember that clip where we talked about the fearless fun, and maybe we can maybe we can share the screen real quick for for something like that. But anyway, the fearless fun is um a venture capital. It was a venture capital fund started by um these black women, and the goal was to help um the goal was to help female business owners, right. Um, kind of get their ideas off the ground, um, and, and to, to provide capital so they can, so they can get their businesses up and running and, and they raise millions of dollars in the process of doing this right. Right. Let me see if I can, I'm just going to try to find this clip real quick and then we're going to, um, we'll, 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 we'll tune into that, whatever. And then we'll, we'll talk about these other things, but, um, yeah, man. So fearless fun, um, was doing really good work, really good work. And then we talked about Edward Bloom though. So like just giving a little bit of primer. Um, we talked about Edward Bloom and he is the man that basically orchestrated um the lawsuit against um Harvard and and University of North Carolina. And it was the front basically the affirmative action case, right? And he's he's the guy, he's the architect um of that of that bill and of those of that law, right? So um, it obviously, you know, what I mean, leaves a sour taste in people's mouth because it's like, like, why, why are you now coming for um, black businesses, black, black female businesses at that, um, especially when um, they don't get the funding that they deserve or that they need anyway. So, yeah, we're going to we're going to I'm going to I'm going to rewind this, whatever. And then we're going to actually show this. So just as a remember uh, a reminder. So, yes, yeah, it says the man behind the lawsuit. This is my this is my clip. It says the man behind the lawsuit that led to affirmative action being struck down by the Supreme Court has a new target and it could affect black entrepreneurs, specifically black women get into a bag. All right. Um, and yes, yeah, so I'm going to play this real quick for y'all. And it's, it's nice to be able to play your own stuff and like you're not worried about like. <laughs> copyright or anything like that you know what i mean um so yeah let's let's share this let's share the audio um so we can and we're going to optimize this for um, a clip so we can um so yeah so I'm, I'm gonna take myself off the screen here but yeah so remember this clip so yeah first he went after black scholars now he's aiming at black entrepreneurs all right so let's let's play this real quick a little bit of a primer of, of where that where this that lawsuit started. came from for the front of action came from a man named Edward Blum. And he's always been anti affirmative action. A lot of his the laws and, and the things that he was proposing was getting shut down. So what he did was he piggybacked off of the Asian students that were complaining that they couldn't get into Harvard. So he decided, you know what, maybe we maybe we actually fare better chances of, of getting rid of affirmative action in colleges. And, and essentially, that's what happened. So he was the head of this lawsuit, right? 
Well, now the man behind the affirmative action lawsuit now aims to fight against a venture capital firm that is designed to help black female entrepreneurs get started. So if you don't know what venture capital is, venture capital is basically, um, think of Shark Tank. So basically you have, you have investors, right? They're, they're trying to use and invest money into these startup companies that have long-term potential, right? So Shark Tank would be a, an example of that those remember. So if you guys remember, I was talking about so yeah, so that um just kind of just kind of give me a primer of that, whatever. So um oh all right, so a couple of things happened. A couple of things happened um last week, all right. So um and let me just see what the date is, what the date is. All right, so I just need to look at my calendar real quick. Come on, calendar. Come on, calendar. <laughs> okay. Okay, so last week would have been the Okay, so this happened on October 26th. Okay, so October 26th. So this is, you know, no, no, September. I'm sorry. September 26th. September 26th. Um, let's see what happened. All right, so um, we're going we're gonna to kind of go through something here, and then um, we're going to talk about it. So um, on September 26th, basically, um, there was, um, here we go, here we go. So it says um a, a federal oh you know let's go back to the other one let's go back to where where they want okay so here we go here we go um so yeah uh, September twenty sixth a federal judge in Georgia denied an injunction to halt Atlanta's fearless front from granting aid to early stage black women own businesses. This notable decision emerges amidst a climate where corporate diversity initiatives are encountering legal and political resistance. The objection was driven by a conservative group led by Edward. And I don't know if it's Blum or Bloom. I don't want to put no respect on this man's name. So I'm a, so if you hear me say Bloom, if you see, hear me say Blum, it's, it is what it is, right? So pre previously known for challenging racial purposes in college admissions, uh, Blum's group Alleged, alleging explicit racial exclusion by the fund mirrored recent attempts to extend the Supreme Court race neutral stance from education to corporate sectors. It says, however, Judge Thomas uh, W. Thrash identified the grant program as a charitable giving. Right. The judge, this judge said he said it's a charitable giving protected under the First Amendment, pushing back against the lawsuit, which argued the grants violated the Civil Rights Act of 1866's racial race neutrality in contracts. This case uh, accentuates the ongoing legal discourse surrounding corporate efforts to address racial inequities. What are your thoughts? All right. So so yeah, that was uh that was you know covered, right? So that's what happened. And again, like it's crazy how we, we this is what we gotta realize like there's definitely laws still on the books, right? That that lawyers and people like edward blum right will use right will use against us now and and talk about um you know this discrimination and racism right so so those law like racial neutrality was be with 1866 like like that was that was in the middle of reconstruction right like that was like that was well not matter of fact reconstruction hadn't even started quite yet right that was literally after the civil war just just you know two years after the emancipation proclamation right so like like black people were although they were free they they did not have rights like they did not have the same kind of rights whatever so we still had we we're, the supreme court too of all of all people they can't even use context right they can't even use context to say yo how you going to try to use this law against black people when y'all know what the climate was like back in 1866 right but just the way just the way le the legal system works and how precedent works right like you can get that shit off and 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 people will still be like you know there's judges that'll be like well it says it in the law yeah those laws were racist as fuck you know what i mean and it's crazy how how race neutrality right is is now being warped and like racism is being flipped back on 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 black people in in many instances and and race and the fight for racial equality is now flipping and where it's like you got groups like this is like yeah this is not fair to 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 white people right to you know and and it's like bro like this is a charitable thing this is something for for us by us right because black women are getting 
of a not even a one percent of all vet and venture capital. There, we're not getting our, our women are not getting the funds, right? To 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 start these businesses, whatever. But then, but it's racist because somebody because because these these smart, powerful black women decided to do something great. Now it's racist. Like that's crazy. Like y'all wasn't like go go to the other other venture capital funds. You know that that are trying that are trying to give money to everybody, so to speak. Right. Go to them. Why why you got to target us? Right. So that's what happened. Right. So the judge said it was good. The judge said it was good. All right, but then the tables turn quick. All right, so it's black. So then on Saturday, like this past Saturday, right? So less than a week later. So this is October twenty sixth. Um, that's when or September twenty sixth. I I got stop saying October. September twenty sixth. Um, that that law was passed saying that they could they could still do the fun, and then again it was less than a week later. What was that? Is that even October yet? Was that or is that September thirtieth? Is that so? Is that September thirtieth? Yeah, September thirtieth. So, so you know, less a couple days later, right? It says a federal appellate panel temporarily blocked Atlanta-based Fearless Fund from awarding twenty thousand dollar grants to Black female entrepreneurs, labeling the program as racially exclusionary and likely violating federal anti-discrimination laws in contracts and contracting. This injunction issued by the U.S. Court of Appeals. For the Eleventh Circuit, follows a lawsuit filed by a conservative group, American Alliance for Equal Rights, challenging the racial criteria of the grant. It says this decision overturns a previous ruling by U.S. District Judge uh, Thomas W. Thrash, who viewed the grant program as a charitable giving. Um, it says a separate panel will further review the case, determining the le the legality of the grant program, while highlighting. Ongoing tensions surrounding race-specific aid initiatives. It says this delay, a setback for Fearless Fund, reflects ongoing tensions around race-specific and aid amidst broader discourse on corporate diversity initiatives. Right, so um, it's crazy, man. It's crazy how the tables can turn in less than a week um, for for these people, especially when when the, we had a positive decision. Um, and it's just like it just feels like cherry picking, man. It just feels like cherry picking. Um, and it's just not it's it's not right, man. It's not right how how we have to kind of we have to fight fight beyond. You know I mean, just to get a little bit. I mean, these are twenty thousand dollar grants, which again, any any startup company, right? That that starting from nothing would love twenty thousand dollars. But like that twenty again, I talked about it in in that episode. Um, that twenty thousand dollars is a drop in the bucket, right? Um, you know, in terms of in terms of what is out there, what else is out there? Like, like this is this is definitely targeted. Um, and and we don't we don't are we allowed to sue these other companies for for being racially ra racially exclusionary because and is it just because like they don't you know they they don't say it's for for certain races? Like, is that is is that why? Um, and it's basically the language. It's like they're playing games with language and it's not good, man. It's like it's it's a it sets a dangerous precedent. It's a slippery slope and it's going to it's going to permeate and lead to other things, man. It's other things like it's like we, we can no longer they feel like I guess the Supreme Court feels like racism is over. Racism doesn't exist. And there there doesn't need to be anything that's specific to black people to help them. Right. Like, you know, what I mean, even if it's even if it's good faith, like it's, it's nothing that that should be black, this black, that whatever. And even though even though, you know, what I mean, there's there's, you know, basically just in the way things are run, there's hidden language and a lot of things that, um, you know, basically still feel like it still feels like blacks are not allowed. You know, what I'm saying to do certain things. Right. So it's just it's it's weird, man. And um, hopefully, man, hopefully. When that case is reviewed, hopefully uh, the ladies of the Fearless Fund um, are able to get that back up and running because, again, they're doing great work. But it's just a just an obstacle, man. Maybe they just got to change. Maybe they got to change what their mission is and then, you know, do do what other people have been doing to us for a long time. Right. So um, just say people aren't qualified. All right. So moving on, moving on. That was crazy. I think that's crazy. Um, gets me fired up. Um, just about that type of stuff because we we see what's happening, man. We see we know that we see the blitz, man. We know what's we know what's going down, man. So, 
Um, that is that. That's that on that. Uh, let's move on, man. And this is probably this is gonna be the last uh major topic that we talk about, and then uh we're probably gonna wrap this up, man. So um just off the headline alone, the headline alone is egregious. Um, so it says a new study, new study finds that yelling at kids is just as harmful as sexual or physical abuse. Now, what a headline. <laughs> what a headline, because it's like it's like, excuse me, did you just say did you just say that yelling at your kids is the same thing as physical or sexual abuse? No, no, like we not we not going for that, though. But let's let's take a look at what what this is all about, though. Um, and we're going we're gonna to put this up here real quick. Um, just give us a little bit of context. All right. Um, so it says here. um in this article, in this study, this study. So it says, um, it says new research suggests yelling at children can be as harmful as physical or sexual abuse. A study by done by UK charity words matter. So this is not even United, like this charity, not even United States. Like this is, this is another country, like whatever, but this charity called words matter wants to recognize childhood verbal abuse as a form of maltreatment. Says researchers from Wingate University and University College London um, analyzed studies on CVA, so that's child verbal abuse, finding that abuse involves negative. So this is what verbal abuse includes: in, in, uh, it's negative speech volume, uh, speech negative speech volume, tone, and speech contact and their immediate impact. It says the study identified parents, which that would be mom and dads. It said parents, mothers. And teachers as primary perpetrators of CVA. So, um, so it's a it's an attack on families. It's an attack on educators, right? It says, um, according to UCL, UCL, uh, the impact of CVA can endure into a childhood's adulthood, causing underlying emotional and psychological repercussions, leading to issues like obesity, heightened anger risk, substance abuse, depression, and self harm. Says researchers stress the need to enhance the definition of CVA. All right, which currently falls under four categories of maltreatment, physical, sexual, emotional, and neglect, right? All those different kinds of abuses. It says um, childhood emotional abuse has, has observed an increase in prevalence over time, as noted in the study. Um, this this just reports the study. This doesn't actually show us what they were actually um, studying or, or how they come to these findings. It says uh, preventing the maltreatment of children is the most effective way we can reduce the prevalence of child mental health problems, said um, study co-author and professor um, Peter Fonegi. All right. So, man, this is this is crazy, man. This is crazy. So just the headline, man, it's like it's like they trying to do stuff that's like extra provocative. Right. So to say that yelling at a kid and, and let me let me start this off. Right. If you actually if you abuse kids, you are the scum of the earth, right? Like there's there's no question about that. Nobody is here, nobody's here to support the abuse of children, right? In in any form, right? In any form. However, however, I know in our society, right, right now, especially in the, in the United States, um, there's there's definitely it feels like there's an attack on families in many different forms. And one um, one thing that comes up is when we talk about like, um, you know, certain communities. I mean, some people say the alphabet community. Right. Versus. Um, and, and when we talk about gender and things like that, like this seems like there's an attack on what's what's, you know, deemed as normal. And you're seeing a lot of conflict when it comes to that, right? But that's an attack on families too, because um, they're passing a lot of laws where kids have all the like they have a lot of rights, right, over their parents and and parents and and um, basically kids are allowed to um, they're allowed to they're allowed. There's laws that that are saying that they can kind of change their their pronouns and how they identify um, in a school setting. Where where parents don't necessarily have to be notified, and then there's these things where like they have permission to um take you know hormone changing drugs whatever um and and sometimes it could be without even the parents' consent and things like that whatever right so so it, it's crazy on that on that realm whatever but like it feels like there's there's been a constant attack on families and parenting and things like that because 
of maybe a few bad seeds, right? Like, uh, uh, and uh, again, if you are abusing kids, if you're doing things um, to harm kids physically, sexually, right? If you're neglecting your, your children and like other forms of emotional abuse, um, yeah, you, yeah, you, sh you should be locked up and, and things like that. Things should happen to you. Um, and you should not, maybe you shouldn't be a parent to those kids, right? Like you, maybe you should lose your kids. However, when we make this spectrum, when we make this, when we, when we broaden these spectrums, whatever, it blurs the lines too much to where, um, it's, and it's make it's making, it's, it's creating a generation of, of adult children, uh, so to speak. Right. Because, when you when you say yelling and and your tone and and things like that, um, you know, and I was talking to somebody and they were just like, yeah, like there's this this idea that that you know, um, it's you can't hurt your kids' feelings, right? Or you know, what I mean, and and that's and I again, I don't. This is provocative, whatever. Like, and you know, nobody should be. You shouldn't be calling your kid a piece of shit, right? Like, obviously, you shouldn't do that, right? And everybody knows that because, yeah, if you if you keep calling your kid a piece of shit, right, every day, right, um, if you keep doing that, right, you keep doing that, then, yes, that 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 kid is going to have low self-esteem. They're probably going to view themselves as a piece of shit. They're going to look at themselves as a failure. They they and they're going to have a lot to overcome. Right. But sometimes, sometimes at, at the very least, at the very least. I should, I, as a parent, I should be able to raise my voice, speak in a certain volume and demand a certain level of respect, right. From my, from my children. Right. Like, like to say that yelling or raising your voice, like, if you know, if you know that, if you know, you know, children in this generation, they think any form of correction is yelling. Right. And so, so we're cultivating a, a society of, of undisciplined, you know, children that are turning into undisciplined teenagers that are turning into undisciplined adults, right? And it's 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 blurring the lines. It's affecting it's affecting all different type of things. It's affecting the workplace, right? Because because you have you have these people that are growing up not being checked, whatever, and they get into the workplace and they don't have a certain tact and they don't have a certain respect for authority and things like that. Um, I mean, it's affecting it's affecting you know the school system because then, um administrators can't do certain things and then and then they and then it's affecting parenting because all right after after the school tries to do the little that they can to to kind of curb certain things once the kid gets back home now the parent can't do anything to to kind of curb curb any dis any form of disrespect or 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 anything like that so like you telling me that my the tone of voice that I that I um use with my kid um you know Obviously, the things that you're saying, yes, you shouldn't be saying certain things, but that should fall into like emotional, you know what I mean? But verbal, just but but me yelling at my kid because they did something, you know what I mean? Sometimes you yell at you yell or you raise your voice at a kid to cause alarm because what they're doing um in that immediate moment needs needs it's like it's almost like an alarm setting off where you need to like warn them or stop them in that moment because that's the only thing that's gonna get their attention, your loud voice, right? Um but you're saying and, and to equate it to physical abuse, to equate it to sexual abuse, like to, to equate it to that, that's nasty. That's nasty because you can't tell me that beating like to 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 physically beat my kids and 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 to to cause physical harm or to to take away their innocence, right? And 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 in and, and heinous ways is the same as when when I'm correcting my child and and you know I mean maybe even using a few cuss words right maybe even using a few cuss words you're saying that's the same thing you're saying it's just as harmful hell no like and I'm not going for it I'm not going for it and I know a lot of parents that aren't going for it whatever but I did hear something and it, it, it was just something to, to think of right like. This person I was talking to, they was like, yeah, like there, there's this idea in society where like you can't hurt you. You're not allowed to hurt a kid's feelings. Right. You're not allowed to hurt a kid's feelings. Right. And um, this person said to me, they said they said, you know, when my when my kid steps out into the real world. Right. They're not going to get their feelings hurt. I, like I don't want they don't want that per they don't want their kids feelings hurt for the first time outside of the home right because because then they they're not gonna know how to regulate that they're not gonna know how to to do anything and then so <laughs> they they they're not gonna know how to cope with that wherever so but like 
some some forms of parenting and some some of the things that you say and things like that it it builds that resilience within your kid right you should be able to correct your kid you should be able to criticize your child if they're if they're not doing what they're supposed to be doing right because then they they understand there's there's a respect there right like yes i could talk to you in a certain way and you need to listen like we're not on equal playing field like like we're yes we're both humans but i am your parent right we are not the same we are not on the same level you do not have the same rights as me as you know what i mean because i am your caretaker and i am doing what i need to do to raise you the right way to put you in a position to win right to put you in a position to be successful but but when when you blur the lines and 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 I can't say certain things, think about think about that. Like like so the even in sports, like coaches, like like yeah, there we have seen some coaches cross the line and and go a little bit overboard, or whatever. But like so so coaches can't do what they got to do because that's how that's just in the world of sports. Like there's a lot of yelling that goes on, right? There's a lot of there's a lot of loud talk, and it might even be some some verbal criticism there that might hurt some feelings, whatever, but that's just, that's just how, that's how you build that resilience, right? We're, we're cultivating a, a society of, of soft people, of, of weak people, of people that don't know how to pick themselves up in the face of adversity because can't nobody talk to them in a certain way. Like, no, you're not allowed to talk to me this way. So I'm thinking like, all right, but but police officers can talk to you in any type of way and you just have to abide. But but we're supposed to know that. Right. Like we're supposed to understand that, like, no, a police officer, you know, what I mean, like they, they can say whatever they want to you. You think you think that I feel like this is a setup. This is a set, like saying this, whatever. This is a setup because then these kids are like, no, you can't talk to me that way because my parent like I could I can I can call children and youth on my on my mom and dad, whatever, because they. They 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 spoke to me too loudly. They yelled at me too much. Whatever they cussed at me. They used a cuss word at me, and so like so what we we gonna we gonna fire coaches or we, or or we gonna get rid of that whatever that that intensity um or or you know when it comes to police like I'm supposed to just know that I'm I'm supposed to just a person a young person is supposed to just accept and and understand that like a cop can talk to them any type of way that they want to. Uh, what about when when people get to the military? Or is the military exempt, right? Because, you know, what I mean, you're going to get a bunch of people that are uh, young people that are going into the military and they're going to implode. They're not even going to know how to deal with things because in the military, they definitely break you down to build you up. Right. But, you know, what I mean, you, are, are, are we going to file lawsuits on on, you know, what I mean, um, you know, drill sergeants and things like that for talking a certain way? No, we're not. We're not going to do that, whatever. So, like, what this is, it's just a dangerous precedent, man. It's a dangerous precedent, and it gives it gives a, a certain sense of control. As kids should have rights. Kids should have rights. Kid, kids should be protected, right? But to that's a that's that's a reach. Like, like that's stretch Armstrong reach, right? To tell me that yelling at my kids is the same thing as somebody like somebody somebody touching my kid inappropriately is the same thing as me yelling at them like on what planet on what on what planet would we agree with that um so i don't know man i i believe in i believe in um trauma and 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 you know you carrying trauma when you're when you're older or whatever but like somebody yelling at you is not causing obesity somebody yelling at you isn't causing substance abuse your and especially your parent, your parent yelling at you isn't causing all these different ailments, right? I'm I'm sorry to tell you, it's not, it's not. Yeah, you know I mean, maybe maybe a bunch of other things, and that's why like these studies come out. It's like, yeah, y'all y'all report the study, whatever, but y'all not really giving us no insight, whatever. My hope is that this doesn't really gain steam, right? This 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 movement towards CVA, whatever, but like. Again, I don't know. I don't know what it is, but it feels like society just has their hands tied, and we we keep adopting these new these new thoughts. Which is good to adopt new thoughts. I'm not I'm not for just staying the same way, but but we keep adopting these these new thoughts, and and we're taking away authority. We're taking authority away. Not even just power. Like right? maybe maybe power is the wrong word, but we are taking that sense of authority. We are taking respect. We are taking tact. Out right because yeah you shouldn't yell at everybody and your parents shouldn't just yell at you for no reason, right? But 
sometimes that's the only way that shit is going to get through your brain. All this talk about gentle parenting and, and things like that. And like, again, these, these parents, they're powerless. They don't know what they're doing. And and everybody's temperament, everybody's temperament is not the same. Yes, if you have an overly sensitive child, then yeah, you probably do need to be a little bit more gentle and you need to be a little bit more soft-spoken and things like that, whatever. But you might have a kid, you might have a child that has a temperament that will that will walk all over you. That, that a child that will walk all over you if you don't, if you don't put your foot down. And and our, our verbal ability, right, and and the, the, no matter the tone and, and and sometimes the content that comes out, that's sometimes our only line of defense. Because yeah, I don't want to, I don't necessarily want to spank my kid, or I don't necessarily want to, I don't want to physically abuse them. The other stuff, the essay stuff, like nobody's doing that to their kid. Like come on, like like that's hate, like that's criminal. Like that is that physical, like those things are criminal. The things that they're talking about are criminal offenses. You telling me so like and that's what I'm saying. It's a slippery slope, right? Children and youth are gonna come at you because because you yelled too you yelled too loud. My kid could call the cops on me because I yelled at them for for not doing something or or for them like they can destroy my house and like I can't I can't react. I can't have a human reaction to that. What like what it what are we doing here? Right. Again, this happened in the UK. This study, hopefully, man. Hopefully, I think we we can take that with a grain of salt. Hopefully, we dig into a study like this and see what it really entails. Because on the surface, it's like, what are y'all talking about? What are y'all talking about, man? Like, again, we could talk about emotional abuse and things like that. But that needs to be kind of in emotional abuse. We can't make it a separate thing. And then now we're creating new offenses um, under that and that's and that's weird and to say it's causing all this stuff the stuff and to compare it to what you're comparing it to nah bro it's not even apples and oranges we talking about you know planets and galaxies man like it's it's different bro like it's different like so you know what i mean like it's not we're not talking about the same thing man so i don't know man now that, that that gets me worked up and i probably probably sound choppy a little bit in in talking about that but it just it, it makes me, yeah, it gets me emotional, man, and, and and angry because it's like, how dare you? Like, how dare you, man? Like, and obviously there are some bad parents out there. There's some bad people out there. And, but like, we can't let the bad seeds, we can't let the very few bad seeds um, of, of our bad parents that do certain things to, to their kids. We can't let the, the things that their transgressions affect all of us and then affect society as a whole. And that's what this is doing, man. So I'm going to stand on that. So, but yeah, man, if y'all watching, man, if y'all watching the podcast, man, I, I need you to hit the like button, hit the subscribe button. What did you think, man? What do you think about all the things that are going on? Did you see that fight? Um, did, you know what I mean? Do you still believe in Coach Prime? Fearless Fun. What would you guys think about that? Tupac's murderer or or a, a man connected to the murderer? Do you feel like justice was served? And then what about this, man? What about this CVA? What the fuck is CVA? Like, what is that? So, but if you're watching, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, share the content with somebody that you know that 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 rocks with podcasts and long form content. Um, yeah, man, we we back. We'll be back for another episode next week. Um, yeah, man, this is another episode of Twitty Plus Podcast, y'all. I'm out.